World leaders at the United Nations talk about the pandemic and international cooperation. We'll take a look to see if their words are matching their actions. Hello, I'm Arnold Nile and this is The Heat. The United Nations General Assembly kicked off on Tuesday. It was a mix of in-person and virtual speeches. Following a long-standing tradition, the Brazilian president, who is not vaccinated against COVID, was the first to speak. U.S. President Joe Biden was next, and closing the morning session was Chinese President Xi Jinping. For the details, let's go now to New York to talk with CGTN correspondent Nathan King. Nathan, President Xi spoke about international cooperation and fighting climate change. What were the main takeaways? Yeah, very much so. Focusing on the problems of today, but also his vision of tomorrow when it comes to uh, international relations. Uh, you're right. Uh, the focus very much on climate, as you know, because the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, really driving uh, pledges towards that key summit in Glasgow in November. Uh, President Xi reiterating China's pledges that it would essentially uh, peak carbon uh, emissions by the end of this decade before 2030 and they'd be uh, carbon net neutral by 2060. You'll remember that surprised a lot of uh, countries when it was announced a, a few months ago. And the one that's getting all the headlines here in New York is China's pledge to stop financing coal-fired power plants as part of the Belt and Road Initiative and elsewhere uh, abroad. That is really going to help. And he was thanked, by the way, uh, in a statement by Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, uh, earlier. When it comes to uh, COVID, of course, uh, very much saying uh, that China will continue to provide uh, vaccines going forward for developing countries and those that don't have them as a public good. I think two billion doses by the end of the year uh, is the target. Uh, remember that a key leader summit uh, on uh, COVID in the next uh, 24 hours. And those, uh, uh, he also reassured uh, delegates here uh, that COVID can be beaten, but he encouraged a science-based approach when it came to uh, 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 vaccines and cures, but also when it comes to finding the origins of COVID, uh, uh, perhaps a barbed uh, uh, criticism there of the United States. And essentially, he also laid out his vision, which we've heard before, of course, because it's a key part of uh, Xi Jinping's thought uh, of a, a shared uh, uh, future for uh, humanity, and essentially saying at a crossroads. Uh, you can either uh, embrace the transformations that are going on or the turbulence. Profound changes are taking place in human society. The world has entered a period of new turbulence and transformation. It falls on each and every responsible statesman to answer the questions of our times and make a historical choice with confidence, courage and a sense of mission. Uh, and while he didn't mention the United States by name, uh, he did say that militarism, forcing democracy uh, by militarism, has never worked. Perhaps a reference there to uh, Afghanistan. And also uh, called on nations to embrace the true multilateralism of the United Nations as a central part uh, of essentially uh, international uh, 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 gathering and law, not necessarily uh, the ad hoc uh, 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 groupings that we've seen recently, of course, with the announcement of the uh, Australian, UK, US AUKUS uh, ad hoc alliance, which will provide Australia with nuclear submarines, and of course, uh, the Quad initiative, which uh, uh, the US is embracing with its first leaders' summit of uh, the Prime Minister of India, the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Prime Minister of Australia, and of course, President Biden at the White House on Friday, while the UN General Assembly, of course, is still going on. Anand. And Nathan, President Biden also spoke uh, at the UN General Assembly. He spoke about the United yeah. States re-engaging with the international community after four years of Donald Trump's America First. This was, of course, uh, President Biden's first speech to the General Assembly as president. How was it received? Well, I mean, obviously, there's always warm applause for uh, the uh, most uh, dominant power in the world in the United Nations, 
uh, chamber, with the one exception, perhaps, of uh, uh, Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> I remember, where there was some laughter. Uh, but it, it was politely received. But I can tell you, uh, uh, Joe Biden's speech was probably for a domestic audience. Let's face it, this is the only time of the year that uh, American media watchers generally uh, uh, look at the United Nations when the U.S. president gives his speech. Uh, basically said America is back. We're focusing on multilateralism. But when you match the rhetoric with the reality, it's not so much the horseshoe 15 members of the U.N. Security Council, which the U.S. is a permanent member, but it's more a sort of table, if you like, excuse the metaphor, where the U.S. sits at the table and the seats are filled uh, by different countries, depending on uh, the U.S.'s uh, once at a time. I mentioned, of course, AUKUS. I, I talked about the Quad, which tends to go away from institutions like this, the United Nations, and regional groupings uh, that are long-standing uh, like ASEAN. So even though the rhetoric may have been saying America is back, there's a lot of people, I can tell you, in the corridors here, especially after the debacle with France and the Australian nuclear deal and the submarines, which essentially said, this just seems like America first in a nicer packaging. Thanks, Nathan. That's CGTN's Nathan King reporting from the United Nations in New York. Well, there is a lot to talk about. Let's get to our panel. From uh, Xinjiang province in China, Ina Tangan is a political and economic affairs commentator. From New York, Robert Hormatz is a former U.S. Undersecretary of State. Negar Mortazavi is a journalist and political analyst joining us right here in Washington, D.C. And also here in D.C., Paulo Sotero is a distinguished fellow at the Brazil Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Welcome to all of you. And Ina Tang, let me start with you. Let's try and get into some of the details of today's proceedings at the U.N. President Xi Jinping, in his address uh, to the World Forum, undertook a very broad overview of the world today. Let's uh, listen to part of what he had to say. Our world is facing the combined impacts of changes unseen in a century and the COVID-19 pandemic. In all countries, people long for peace and development more than ever before. Their call for equity and justice is growing stronger, and they are more determined in pursuing win-win cooperation. So, I know it seems there's one big difference between China and the United States when it comes to how they approach uh, the world's problems. I mean, we listen to China there. It has a more global outlook, emphasizing multilateralism, while the United States sees the world in terms of winners and losers. President Biden talks about this being a competition, which implies a winner and a loser. How significant is that difference, um, given that, you know, that that difference does exist? They've talked about it. And can they work together? Well, that's the, the real question. The U.S. still sees the world in, you know, through this lens of what is good for the United States. Uh, as uh, pointed out by Nathan, this was a, uh, by Biden, it was all about the domestic audience. In contrast, she was talking about statesmanship. He was talking about what the world uh, needs. It was very much to the international community. And this, this, this is where the real rub comes in. You have very, very, very different views. The U.S. trying to reestablish itself, not reestablish, to maintain its hegemony in terms of military, political, and economic uh, influence, whereas China is saying, look, it's a new world. Let's get down to the realities and let's do something where we share a future as opposed to being dominated by a power through um, in the future. Robert Hormatz, after four years of America First under Donald Trump, this was, uh, as I mentioned, Joe Biden's first address to the United Nations General Assembly as president. He again reiterated that America is back. But as we heard from our reporter Nathan King in New York, is America really back, or is it still America first, albeit in a much nicer package, as Nathan put it? Well, I, I think there's sort of a middle ground here. I think America is certainly back compared to what it was over the last four years, with the United States supporting uh, the United Nations, supporting the Paris Climate Accord, uh, becoming much more involved in the negotiations uh, with other countries um, in our own hemisphere, trying to work out something with Iran on the nuclear issue. Uh, so the U.S. is certainly much more engaged with the rest of the world. On the domestic side, however, and the point was just made, I think, rather well, 
Um, there are a lot of Americans who do look at the world less in terms of America's proactive leadership and more in terms of how do we deal with a very, very um, substantial set of domestic problems that, that we have in, in this country that have to be dealt with. So the notion of the U.S. being a big giver of aid um, is uh, no longer likely. Uh, the, 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 the point on democracy is that I do think Biden now, and I think Americans now, after a number of very bitter disappointments and mistakes, uh, have come to the conclusion that you cannot uh, enforce uh, either by military action or really by political pressure uh, democracies in other countries. Other countries and other cultures have their own ways of doing things, and the United States can emphasize our values, which I think are quite good um, and are commendable, but you can't make other countries accept those values and unless you understand foreign societies, which the United States sometimes has difficult do doing, um, you're really going to find it very difficult by any means to make um, or to encourage or to get big changes in other countries. They will do it at their pace and we can influence them, but we're not gonna be able to get them to make changes if they don't want to. Nagar Mosesavi, great to see you. Great to have you back with us again. The new Iranian president, uh, Saeed Ibrahim Raisi, was very critical in his speech of U.S. sanctions against Iran. He called it America's new way of war and a violation of human rights and said the world doesn't really care about America first or America is back. Let's listen to what he had to say. This year, two scenes made history. One was on January the 6th, when the U.S. Congress was attacked by the people, and two, when the people of Afghanistan were dropped down from U.S. planes in August. From the capital to Kabul, one clear message was sent to the world. The United States hegemonic system has no credibility, whether inside or outside the country. Senegal, this is a new leader in Iran. He's been described as being more conservative than his predecessor. Um, where do you see the relationship with, with, say, the United States going right now, listening to what uh, Raisi had to say there? The closest comparison in recent memory that we can look at as far as real experience is the years of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the previous hardline president in Iran, with sort of similar tones, actually, when he came to the UN. He was a big fan of the UNGA, um, used to travel to New York a lot. And um, it's sort of going back to that era. But then at the same time, Ibrahim Raisi is also um, sort of being prepared and has ambitions beyond the presidency. This is a stepping stone for him to potentially be a successor Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. So this is sort of a new era for the hardliners. We can also take a look back at the years of the of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, more of an anti-Western rhetoric, less of this willingness to engage and um, work diplomatically with the West, with the Europeans, and specifically with the United States and Washington, compared to the previous uh, moderate administration of Hassan Rouhani, and more of a shift to the East, possibly to the region, making amends inside the region with Iran's rivals, but also more of a shift to the east towards China, Russia, and other um, Asian countries for trade and, um, and other issues. Senegal, can we assume then that this address to the UN was targeting more domestic audience rather than the World Forum? Uh, because as you say, he has bigger political ambitions as well. Audience. There's also a regional audience. Iran has uh, sort of its own base within the region, across the region. Um, speaking of the of the people of Palestine and Yemen and other places, and obviously there is part of the global audience that the hardliners in Iran have always been eyeing with this anti-imperialist and anti-Western, especially anti-American rhetoric. And part of what he's been saying is shared with what the moderate faction. Um, in Iran um, thinks and says, but the approach of the hardliners, specifically the camp that Ibrahim Raisi comes from, is going to be very different. His faction has been very vocal against negotiations with the U.S., the JCPOA, and I just think 
a return to the nuclear deal, the road ahead is just going to be more bumpy and complicated and difficult than it was uh, under Hassan Rouhani. Paulo Sotero, let's talk about Brazil. Of course, uh, as we reported, the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, he was the first speaker at the UN General Assembly on Tuesday. He focused in his address on climate change and committed the country to carbon neutrality by 2050. There was a very positive outlook as far as that was concerned um, in Brazil. But does, does that belie the fact that there is deep opposition to the president right now in Brazil? More than half the country does not approve of the way he's handled the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and he's now running well behind uh, Lula da Silva, who's expected to be his, the opposition candidate in the election next year. But do you think this speech would have changed many minds in Brazil? No, not at all. I think it was not taken seriously by most Brazilians. Uh, the comments in Brazilian media today were very, very negative. Uh, Bolsonaro is probably already organizing his way out of this. Uh, let's see that he keeps things where they are, more or less. I'm talking here about corruption. Uh, and uh, uh, that he uh, goes out uh, in a, uh, you know, uh, in a decent way. Uh, don't count on that. His uh, mentor, uh, his guide is Donald Trump. He may try to create a confusion, create chaos in Brazil. Uh, we have uh, spec, we have and analyzed, speculated uh, a lot about a possible self-coup. Uh, uh, only weeks ago, uh, there was enormous anxiety about that. Bolsonaro has no uh, commitment to a rules-based system, be whatever the system is. Uh, he is highly incompetent as a politician. Uh, he was elected in a very special circumstances as after the trauma of the collapse, uh, the economic collapse of Brazil under uh, the uh, Workers' Party of President Lula, especially under President Dilma Rousseff. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 this, his presence today at the UN is an embarrassment to Brazil. Uh, he lives in a uh, parallel reality. He uh, did plenty of uh, misinformation regarding COVID in Brazil. It's a disaster. We had we lost 600,000 people. Absolutely unnecessarily. Brazil has a tradition of. Uh, good epidemiology of good health care in this area particularly uh, and uh, on he, he, he actually frankly he lied a lot uh, in regards to uh, deforestation it is a nightmare what's going on in Brazil uh, so uh, you know uh, I think that uh, uh, any Brazilians that follow international news should, as I do, I feel embarrassed by this president, and, uh, and I apologize to my friends for the fact that we elected such person to Brazil. Brazil, remember, was a substantive player uh, in the international community, in the United Nations, uh, and today Brazil is a non-existent uh, 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 actor. Uh, we'll have to wait to see what we resolve there, where, what way we go uh, uh, in the next uh, presidential election. That will happen, will take place. But it's a long uh, uh, road to, to reconstruction mm -hmm. of a country that was once substantial in international affairs. Right, and that election will take place next year. Anna Tangan, I want to get back to President Biden's speech to the UN General Assembly. There was a part of his speech where he didn't mention China by name, but it was clear whom he was referring to in that part of the speech. Let's listen to it. The United States will compete and will compete vigorously and lead with our values and our strength. We'll stand up for our allies and our friends and oppose attempts by stronger countries to dominate weaker ones whether through changes to territory by force, economic coercion, or technical exploitation, or disinformation. <clears throat> but we're not seeking, say it again, we are not seeking 
a new Cold War. So, I know the United States has gone to a lot of pains, and we've heard this over the last few months, that it is not starting a Cold War with China, that it doesn't want a Cold War with China. But that has not allayed the fears of even its allies who fear that there could be a new Cold War coming on. Um, do you believe the United States is not seeking a Cold War, given its recent actions? Well, unfortunately, this is an old tactic uh, where when you're doing something yourself, you accuse your opponent of doing it. Uh, the whole list of things that he talked about in terms of co coercion, misinformation, disinformation campaigns, enforcing values, I, I think it's fairly clear that this is what the U.S. failed at doing in Afghanistan, in um, uh, the Middle East, uh, frankly, if you go back through history in South America and Africa. So at, at this juncture, uh, you know, as we've said before, this is a uh, speech aimed at the domestic audience. It is not the speech of a statesman. It is the speech of somebody who still holds on to this idea that America can enforce or force its values on other countries. And this is exactly uh, what he's saying. On one hand, he's saying, oh, we're not doing this, but quite frankly, the U.S. is committed to it. Robert Hormetz, uh, in an earlier address to the United Nations, the uh, UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, he said that the world is facing a formidable array of problems right now. He talked about the COVID-19 pandemic uh, being one of them, climate change being the other, inequality, issues of governance as well. But he said that major powers in the world are moving in the wrong direction and need to change that. Do you agree with that assessment? And if you do, what needs to change? Well, I think there's a lot to what he said. Uh, I, I think what we're seeing now is growing friction um, among the major powers uh, for a variety of reasons and in a variety of areas. Uh, but it's, it's not only with the major powers, with other small or medium-sized powers. And I don't think it's so much that the U.S. is trying to enforce its values uh, on other countries. I think perhaps over the last 20 years, as I mentioned earlier, through a lot of bitter and unsatisfactory and unsuccessful experiences, we did try to do that. Um, going back, say, to Vietnam and various parts of the Middle East, and it didn't work, and it just created a lot of chaos and negative reaction. I think we've probably learned that we, we can't do that. I, I do think, though, that we have another problem, and that is that there, te there tends to be, when the UN started, a positive-sum game notion that if countries work together, uh, they may not always agree, but if they work together, they could accomplish things. And the Paris Accord is uh, one, of the, one of the recent things that has been accomplished. Now my fear is that a lot of countries look at a lot of issues as sort of a negative sum game, that I win, you lose, you win, I lose. And we, we've moved away from this notion that almost all the world's problems today that we're talking about can only be resolved uh, successfully and constructively if at least the two major powers, China and the U.S., work together, but not just China and the U.S. It's not a two-power world. It's going to require other countries. It's going to require ASEAN. It's going to require Japan. It's going to require uh, Western Europe, Latin America. And I think that we're, we're, we're not uh, able, um, or at least not able in, a, in an effective way, to get countries working along the same track. And it does, And I do fear that um, COVID has been a divisive force in, in some areas and, and created a lot of tensions between countries. Uh, there is hope, though. And I think that if you, if you look at... I think we lost a lot of formats there. ...financial issues, they all have to be dealt with in a collective way. And we may learn that the hard way if we don't do it. Um, but the, the right way to do it is to figure out that if we don't work together, these things are going to get worse, and we're all going to suffer mutually assured disruption. That's my worry.
Nagar, I'm going to get back uh, to the uh, nuclear deal, the Iranian nuclear deal, otherwise known as the JCPOA. Uh, President uh, Raisi, in his address to the UN, said that he hopes that that deal can be resurrect resurrected, that it can get back on track. He wants a resumption of talks. Is that likely? I think there needs to be some major shifting of gears also happening in Washington. Obviously, there's a more hardline team in power in Tehran, but here in Washington also, President Biden didn't take the necessary and bold steps needed to return to the JCPOA when the moderates still had the power in Tehran. President Trump pulled out of the JCPOA. The United States currently is not within the deal, is outside of the deal, is in right. full non-compliance, basically, and Iran has reduced compliance, so there needs to be a sort of compliance for compliance, but also a bold step, which requires spending some political capital in Washington done by President Biden, and then hopefully the hardliners on the other side um, will also um, sort of make concessions right. for a full return to the JCP. So it's a possibility, but I think President Biden needs to spend some political capital when it comes to his opposition here in D.C. Right. Paulo Sotero, you know, as Robert Hormat uh, told us a moment ago, you know, many of the world's problems, especially the pandemic that we're facing right now, can only be solved by the whole work world working together, not just one power, two powers, but many, many countries working together. But let's look at the incidents of Brazil right now. President Bolsonaro is against any kind of vaccine passport. He himself is not vaccinated. Um, in fact, when he was in New York over the past few nights, he had to dine outside uh, of restaurants uh, in New York because he wasn't vaccinated. And uh, I mean, besides that, um, I mean, you mentioned a moment ago that Brazil has suffered 600,000 deaths in the in the in the pandemic. That's second only to the United States. Um, and when you have a leader like this, to what extent does it complicate global efforts to resolve the problem? It does, because Brazil could be a positive force on this. Science in Brazil started in combating epidemics, and uh, uh, it is uh, sad. We should be helping our immediate neighbors. We have the capacity. We have a great tradition, uh, our doctors, our hospitals, etc., in that regard. But when you pick a leadership of the sort we unfortunately have now, uh, you are paralyzed, and uh, there is the, the governors in Brazil are doing their best to address the problem as they are doing their best to address climate change, protection of the Amazon forest. Right. But when you have a person of the ilk of uh, Jair Bolsonaro yeah. at the helm, well, you pay a price and will pay this price for a long time. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us on the show. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.